Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Soft Rep Radio, Soft Rep Radio on time, on target. I am your host this afternoon, Steve Balistrieri. Joining us, we have a great special guest with us, Mike Durant, who most of you would remember from the book and the film Black Hawk Down. Mike was the helicopter pilot, which was the Black Hawk Down that everything was uh, based upon. Mike uh, did 22 years in the military. He's now retired from the military and he's running for office. He's running for the Senate. And uh, we're going to talk to him about that. Uh, But before we go any further, we want to just welcome him to the podcast. Mike, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Yeah, so... Let's talk a little bit about your military career. I know you said you grew up up north. Um, so uh, where did you grow up and what made you decide to join the military? Well, first, your accent is still a little bit more dominant than mine is. I will say that. Uh, I, I grew up in New Hampshire, northern New Hampshire, actually, yep. about halfway between yep. Montreal and Boston. So, you know, the big, uh, big debate in my hometown, pretty small paper mill town, was whether you're a Montreal Canadiens fan or a uh, Boston Bruins fan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think I I probably did a little of both, but uh, today I would I'd characterize myself as a Bruins fan, Red Sox fan, Patriots fan. So, you know, that's where my allegiance ended up. Um, but I, uh, I joined the military when I was 18. I, I wanted to fly. I had gotten to know a gentleman who was a warrant officer flying for the New Hampshire National Guard. He had uh, his own private business where he owned some aircraft, and I got to go flying with him one day. And, you know, anybody that's ever been in a helicopter, your first helicopter ride is, I don't know anyone that's not just in awe of it. You know, it's just kind of crazy. It's like a hummingbird, right? This is, I guess, is the sensation that you think you have. And, and I, I'm sitting there looking at him, and I'm thinking, this is a job? I could do this and get paid to do this? The, 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 this is for me. So he set me on that course. And I found out later he actually had done that with, with uh, several teenagers that he knew. And I don't know how many of us ever made it all the way through to flight school, but uh, that was my inspiration to, to join the military. Yeah, it's funny. You talk about the first time in a helicopter. My, my first helicopter ride, I didn't land in it. We, we did a helicopter jump right after jump school. So, yeah, that was uh, what a trip that is. And, uh, but, well, I, you know, I'm a big fan of staying on board the aircraft, <laughs> unless it's under extreme circumstances. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I've certainly done enough para jumps to know uh, it's a it's pretty cool yeah. So, uh, you know, you went to Fort Rucker and you were probably a Huey pilot to start off. Well, you know, Blackhawks were brand new and I, I did pretty well in school and I got the only Blackhawk slot in the class. So uh, I went straight to the Blackhawk transition. And, uh, you know, I I'm, again, it's sort of the same feeling. I got in the Blackhawk after going through the, the training in a Huey in flight school. And it seemed like flying a space shuttle. I mean, it, it's you know, much more powerful, a lot more gadgets and things in the cockpit. And and when you're fairly new to flying, uh, getting in a machine like that was just incredible. Uh, and then I, I went to Korea for my first assignment, and they didn't have Blackhawks yet. So I got back into the Hueys <laughs> for a few months, and then we got a whole shipment of brand new Blackhawks about uh, four months after I got there. What were you in the second ID up there in Korea? I flew medevac, which, you know, initially I, I didn't think that was going to be a great assignment. But in the end, as a pilot, it's a it's a fantastic assignment because you're by yourself a lot of times and it forces you to make decisions and deal with weather. And, you know, you're, you're going out on emergency calls and we were we would track the number of missions that you flew uh, in that unit. And I ended up leaving there with one hundred and fifty one actual medevac missions, wow. which, uh, you know, when wow. when you survive you know, I'll call them real world. They are, you know, sometimes it's uh, not a critical situation, but a lot of times it was. And, uh, you know, somebody who's that young, I mean, I was 22 years old, uh, as pilot in command making those decisions, it's a great way to either get really good or end your flying career really fast. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I got I got a lot better in a, in a very short period of time. Yeah, I would imagine that, that flying that many real world missions. Yeah, just fantastic. But, you know, it's one of those things that 
uh, if you'd asked me, I probably wouldn't have selected going there because, you know, to me, flying in the division would have been, you know, formation flights and, and supporting the, the, the ground, ground force units. But in the end, I think from a gaining experience perspective, it was a really good first assignment. That's awesome. Uh, how did you end up with the uh, 160th? Well, it's, I first heard about the 160th in Korea. And at the time, like a lot of other special ops units, you know, people kind of knew they existed, but there wasn't a lot in the, in the public domain. Uh, it was mostly, you know, just bar talk about, hey, there's this unit that was stood up to, to support these other special units. And they got really, you know, cutting edge technology in their aircraft and they got you know, they're, they're operating with some of the most elite units in the world. And I, I'd read a lot of Tom Clancy books. I mean, I'd just be perfectly honest. And, it, <laughs> and, and that, that's probably what hooked me, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. to, to be, uh, you know, like a Jack Ryan type or just, you know, work with people like that. I, I thought, you know, that's got to be next level. And it really was. I mean, it wasn't a disappointment. So when I got my uh, orders to leave Korea and go to Fort Campbell, I thought, well, this is perfect. I'll just show up there. I'll sign in, I'll go talk to the 160th and see if they'll take me. What I didn't realize is that the 101st and the 160th are two distinct organizations, and I'd signed in the 101st, and at that point I was kind of committed to two years in, in the 101st, which is, again, great experience. It, it was good for me. It worked out better in the end because I got more flight time, I got more night vision goggle time. Uh, I went to the instructor pilot course while I was in the 101st, so when I two years later was able to actually assess for the 160th that I was in a, a from you know aviation maturity level much much better prepared excellent yeah a quick story about the 160th we we used to do a lot of exercises with the 160th in the uh, ranger regiment and uh, we were doing a big one and then we had a night off and you know we were just kind of chilling out and the the major in charge of the unit from the uh, 160th. I, I can't remember his name now, but I, I still have the coin he gave me. So he came up to me and he was like, hey, we're going on a check ride. We got some new NVGs. You want to go do some flying in the Little Bird? So I'm like, sure. So, you know, when you're young, hey, you can't get enough of that, right? So I, I'm sitting, it was all, just me and the pilots. So I'm sitting outside on the Little Bird. They gave me a, a helmet with the NVGs and he's like, leave them up. So it was pitch black and we're zipping along. I can't see a blessed thing, you know, pitch dark. And then, uh, so we're flying along and I can feel dampness. So he's like, can you see anything? Cause I'm talking to him on the intercom. I said, I can't see a thing. He's like, flip down your NVGs. And then both pilots were staring at me cause I literally jumped out of my skin. We were about maybe 14, 15 inches over a river. And we were zipping along the river. And when I put the NVGs down, and of course, the, you, your first thought is, we're going to crash in the water. <laughs> and they were both laughing. And they were like, what do you think? And I was like, man, you can really see good in these. And that was the, you know, that, that next generation. And, you know, we zipped around all night. And we had a, an absolute blast. And that's, you know, we flew with them quite a few times. But I'll always remember that because that was a... It's kind of like a personal ride for me in, in a little bird and that's uh that's flying at the edge right there so can can you um i i don't know if it's difficult to talk about but you know the mission that you were shot down in can you relay some of that to our listeners sure you know one thing i, I like to point out which i think is true of many military organizations in, in general, but certainly soft units, is that when, when the mission goes well, it gets buried in, in, in some archive somewhere and no one ever knows about it. And there are thousands of missions that have gone well. And it's only the ones where, you know, something doesn't go exactly the way <laughs> it was supposed to go and the media gets involved that you know, suddenly, you know, everybody knows about it. And, uh, you know, you could, you could say that about Desert One, you could say that about, and, and I would argue, Somalia, I personally believe it was a tactical success, it was a political failure. Uh, you know, the, the, the lost bird uh, in, the, in the compound in, in Pakistan with the Bin Laden raid. I mean, those, those are things that happen when 
people were operating at the very edge of the envelope. And, uh, you know, when you operate at the edge of the envelope for night after night after night, like, like our brothers have been doing or still doing really in Iraq and we're doing in Afghanistan, you know, for two decades. I mean, every now and then something's going to go wrong. And, and you know, th that's what I would say about Somalia. You know, I, I was involved in Just Cause, went really well, the incredibly complex mission. I mean, we think about the joint exercises that we would do, airfield seizures, all that stuff. I mean, Panama was a textbook example of all of that happening simultaneously, uh, and it went almost without a hitch. I mean, there were a few things that happened. You know, we did uh, the aircraft with Kurt Muse on it got crashed in the, in the street, but in the end he got out and, and uh, you know, everything went as planned. So the point of all that is there's so much flawless execution that occurs that never gets talked about. And unfortunately, the high profile things where maybe it didn't go quite as well as we wanted to do get talked about. And, that, and that's kind of the way I, I see Somalia. Uh, you know, we had done six missions up to that point. All six of those had gone really well, three day, three night. We had captured close to 30 guys. I mean, today we'd call them terrorists. At the time, they weren't called terrorists. They were called, you know, clan leadership. They were part of the Haber Getter clan that we were trying to basically uh, neutralize. You know, they were the ones that were causing the problems in country. And uh, the, the, the leader, uh, Mohammed Far Adid, was the ultimate prize. We had captured the number two guy, a guy named Osman Otto, on a day mission not, not long before October 3rd. <clears throat> so, I mean, we're, you know, the wheels are turning here. We're really doing well. We hadn't lost any birds, no people, few injuries, but that's going to happen in this kind of thing. And then October 3rd rolls around. And, you know, I was a flight leader, so I, I'm right in the jock when the decision's getting made about this. It's not my decision, but I'm there. And, and we were aware of the risks. And, you know, I always point, at least from an air side, it's in the worst part of town, a place called the Black Sea, where all the bad guys hang out. It's a daytime operation. We know, you know, we can't use a lot of our advantage that we have with our night vision gear and everything in a day, daytime op. There's no landing zones, so we can't, we can't land the helos. We've got to fast rope in. We've got to extract by vehicle. And it's the seventh time we've done one of these in the same city. So, you, you know, anyone that's been in the military knows it's like sports, right? You can't run the football seven times in a row up the middle, you know, at the five-yard line. The, the defense is going to start to adapt. And that's what, you know, military adversaries do the same thing. So I think all those things combined elevated the risk on this one for sure. But I can say walking out of that operation center, I didn't disagree with the decision to go. I, I mean, the risk factors were up. I, I always say I felt comfortable enough. Um, you know, I've also thought over the years, if you're totally comfortable going in to uh, the bad guy's backyard and punching him in the face, then maybe you've been doing it too long because you, you should be, you know, not totally comfortable. This, you know, they're, they're shooting at you, you know. So, but, you know, we, we all operate under the big sky little bullet theory and kind of put that off to the side and just do our jobs. But, you know, going in there, we kind of knew this was not not going to be quite as straightforward as all the others and and you know the first real indication of that was the first aircraft shot down that was super 6-1 cliff walcott donovan briley's aircraft they they had uh a, a few uh delta operators on board uh some were injured badly some not so badly crew chiefs survived but don uh, uh donovan and cliff were killed when the aircraft hit the ground and uh you know at that point of course i didn't know it uh, all i knew is they were they went down and uh, we called in the search and rescue bird. It went in. We knew that wasn't a good idea. We had talked about it a few days prior. We had actually requested a tank because everything was within about two miles of the airfield. So in our minds, if we use a tank for search and rescue, seems unorthodox, but when you really look at the tactical situation, using a tank is, that, is, the ele is a very elegant solution because it's not going to be harmed by small arms fire. It can move pretty quickly through the streets. You know, it's, it's, it's the perfect vehicle. So we had asked for that. It had been turned, it had been denied. So what is the commander supposed to do, right? I mean, you, you're forced to use the things you're, you're left uh, in your kit bag. So we sent the search and rescue bird in and it got shot down. Luckily not, it didn't crash, but limped its way back to the airfield. Uh, we still had people hanging on the ropes when that aircraft got hit. Um, 
but they all did what they were supposed to do, kept the aircraft in, in position and got everybody on the ground. That search and rescue team got to 6 one site. In the meantime, commander calls me and asks me to come replace 6 one over the target. So we roll in and we had already gone in the target because I had 22 Rangers, part of a blocking force that were on my bird. And we'd put them in, in one of the corners around the perimeter. And so we're, we just have the crew on board. And we're gonna go in with the mini guns and try to get in close and provide uh, close in fire support while things get wrapped up on the ground and uh, the ground convoy links up with the assault force and then gets everybody out of there. Well, you know, things had heated up quite a bit. I mean, you've already had two Blackhawks shot down. And uh, I mean, we didn't make it around the target probably four times and we got hit by an RPG. Uh, you know, it's still daytime. So, you know, I always tell people it wasn't like the beach scene in uh, Saving Private Ryan where there's flack everywhere. You know, it just it's hard to see tracers in the bright in the bright sunlight and RPGs. Unless you see the launch, there's not really much of a, a, a contrail. You know, so you might see it. You're going to see it explode if it explodes near you. But a lot of times they're just you know they're going through the air and you don't even know they're there. Well, it, this one hit us in the tail. It blew the tail rotor completely apart, uh, disintegrated, and uh, you know you don't have to be a helicopter expert to know that's probably not a good thing. It was it was worst profile you could be in: low altitude, low airspeed, uh, no tail rotor, and the only thing you can do is shut the engines off. So we did, which is not a good thing either, and uh, we crashed. Uh, I was flying. I. Uh, it's sort of a mix between flying and surviving because, you know, this thing is not flying like a regular helicopter at this point. It's spinning out of control. And all I was trying to do is keep it from flipping upside down, which I somehow managed to do, but I never saw the ground coming. So, I mean, we hit really hard. I mean, so hard, you know, you've probably seen the pilot seats in a Blackhawk. They, they have crash attenuation in them, basically big shock absorbers. Those all went all the way to the bottom and then broke off. My femur broke in two on the way down. My vertebrae were crushed in the, you know, from the vertical G-forces. Crew chiefs were hurt worse than that. Uh, my co-pilot, Ray Frank, was injured similar to my injuries. And, uh, and then the aircraft did what it was supposed to do, which is uh, the engines shut off because the fuel lines all broke away as designed. You know, one of the things about modern technology is we, we learned a lot from experiences like Vietnam and since and making these machines better, more survivable. And, and it all worked as advertised. The, the fuel lines broke off and they self-seal, so they didn't leak, there was no fire. And when I woke up, it's like someone had shut the aircraft down. I mean, it's, it's just sitting there, blades are stationary. Uh, but I'm, obviously, you know, I know something's really wrong here. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of sitting in a hole. There's debris through the windshield. I get rid of that. And I had my MP5 in the cockpit. And I picked it up and, you know, there's not much else you can do. You just, just decide to, you know, fight it out the best you can. And uh, about that time, most courageous men I've ever known, Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, arrive at the side of the cockpit. I didn't, I didn't see where they came from. I had no idea how they got there. Uh, but all of a sudden, they're standing there. And I, they were not personal friends, but I did know them mm -hmm. from, you know, we've been together on Task Force Ranger now for a couple of months. And, uh, I, you know, my mind, wow, this is they're already here. I don't know how in the world this happened, but yeah, good to see you guys, you know. And they weren't talking. They were, you know, it's all mission at this point for, for, for those guys. And uh, they got me out of the aircraft, put me on the ground, gave me my weapon, and uh, went to try to defend the site and then find a way to get us out of there. And uh, unfortunately, we were surrounded, and there was, there was probably hundreds of Somalis. And uh, I think the movie shows that scene fairly well, actually. Uh, outside of it shows me shooting from the cockpit. I did not shoot from the cockpit. I was about to, but I never did. But did a lot of shooting on the ground, and as did Randy and Gary. And then uh, just, I mean, they're just outnumbered. I mean, there's nothing you can do when you're up against that many enemy. And uh, and then we got overrun. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, I, you know, I've read the book. I've seen the movie. I was going to ask you how realistic or close to the truth that was. You know, I, I've always said it's accurate enough. Um, it's not perfect. There's, you know, little things like this person did something that actually another person did. But most of the things in the movie are, 
are fairly accurately portrayed. And then after they, you know, were uh, were killed by the Somali crowd, you were taken captive. I can't imagine what was going through your mind at that point with a crushed spine and a broken leg. It's not like you can E&E. Right. Uh, you know, I had gone to survival school, as we spoke about earlier. <clears throat> and, you know, we can't really get into what's taught there. But, but at that point, I did make a decision in my head that this is now survival. I mean, it's this fight is over. I can't win this fight. I'm by myself. I was out of ammunition. Uh, they're all over me, and now you got to do what they teach you to do to survive. And and it worked. I mean, you know, I've been back to the survival school. It's been a while now, but they have it all on video, and 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 I'm sure they still use some of it in the curriculum. Uh, what they taught worked, and you know, I, I'm not suggesting it would work in every situation, but it actually it worked. Almost everything they taught me worked in mine. So I, I not only owe my life to uh, Gary and Randy, but to the, you know, that training and the, and the instructors that provided that for me. Yeah, it's not a fun school, but it's a great school. That's the way, when people ask me about Sears School, <laughs> that's the only way to describe it. Yeah, I always said, I put it only second only to flight school in terms of experiences that I've had in, in the military. Uh, in, you know, at the end, like you said, <laughs> Man, I'm glad that's over. But it was it was really really good. Yeah. And what was it like for you when you were finally released and now you're back with you know the guys in the unit and the Delta guys? It, it was uh, it was somewhat surreal. You know, one of the things they they do teach you is you know be very cautious about you know what you believe is happening versus what's really happening and don't you know just just. Be cautious, I guess, is the best way to characterize it. And uh, I think when I first realized that this is real is when the Red Cross doctor showed up and he had morphine, you know, because it had been 11 days with those injuries, and I'm telling you, it was, it was bad. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that made it all go away. And uh, when I went through the gates of the compound, it was, uh, you know, can't describe it. It's just, uh, and again, I didn't know about the losses we took. I mean, I knew we took losses, but I didn't know about how many there were or the horrific things that had happened in the aftermath. So, you know, over the next few days, I had some major, major emotional events when, you know, I found out Cliff and Donovan. And the only reason I knew that they were killed is all the guys came over when I was in the, uh, in the surgical unit there, and I'm looking around, and I said, where's Cliff and Donovan? And, uh, you know, they basically broke down, uh, commander broke down, uh, just a good guy, good heart, you know, tears in his eyes saying, you know, they, they, were, they were killed. And, you know, after everything else, you find out that it's even worse than you thought. You know, it was, uh, it was pretty rough. And then, you know, with what happened to, uh, to the, the remains of, of my crew and Gary and Randy and by the crowd is something I found out even later and something I still can't really get my head around how, how people could be that uh, in, uh, inhuman I suppose is the right way to, to describe that yeah I remember um, I was in South America at the time and we were working with some of your other guys and we were doing counter narcotic stuff and we started seeing all the newspapers with the pictures in there and it was, it was horrifying and uh, well, it made a lot of people angry. I can tell you that. You know, it's, uh, and, and, and you, you know, you know how we all feel about each other. When you see something like that done to your your brothers in arms, I mean, that's uh, that's hard. That's hard to see. So, um, you finished up twenty two years in the uh, in the military, and then so. Now, now you're you're moving on. I know you started your own company, but now you're moving on and you're running for office. What dis, what made you decide to try this? Well, is a is a is a series of things really. Um, I suppose it all started when President Biden won the election. I don't think he's good for the country. Uh, you know, I don't care which side you're on, 
to think that that's the best that one of the parties can put forward, that's pretty, that's pretty disheartening. I mean, he is the ultimate example of a career politician. I mean, he has never lived in the real world. He doesn't understand the implications of his decisions. I mean, every single thing he's done is, is wrong. And, and, you know, like many Americans, I've sat here and watched this happen. The real over-the-top moment was Afghanistan. Uh, and there have been others since, you know, the southern border, uh, vaccine mandates, you know, paying people who came through the border illegally $450,000 a piece. That's the latest ridiculous idea that I've read about lately. Uh, just, I mean... It, and so I'm at this point in my business career where the company's doing great. Uh, I got good people working for me. I got good people above me on the board. I was kind of planning to start phasing out now anyway. Our youngest is a senior in high school. Transitioning ownership to the employees actually through a program called an ESOP that uh, if, if anyone is not familiar with that, you should look it up. It's an amazing thing uh, and, and really, really a win-win for the for the founders and for the employees. And, and so all that was underway anyway. And then Richard Shelby's retiring. I mean, what, what, what you don't want to do is take on a, a, an incumbent senator, you know, that's been there for, you know, multiple terms. That, that's a tough win, but this is a, a vacant seat. And the candidates that were in the run are just more career politicians. And that is not what Alabama needs and that is not what the country needs. We got to have somebody that knows the difference between right and wrong. And career politicians really struggle with that. All they know is what's going to further their political careers. That's that's the the, the world they grew up in. That's what what drives their thought process. Whereas you know somebody like us that's lived in the real world, we know what's right and wrong. You know, for me, I, I basically have two resumes to their zero. You know that. They've got a career politician resume, which is zero when it comes to making the right decisions. I got a military resume and I got a business owner resume, both. So I know, you know, how decisions affect both of those uh, constituents or, or bases or, you know, part, part of what I represent as a senator from Alabama. So uh, it's winnable. I'm at the right point in my life. Somebody's got to step up. And I, I can't waste my shot. I mean, that's that's what got me in the race. And uh, do you live in Huntsville now? Is that? I do. Uh, and Huntsville actually just became the largest city in Alabama. We uh, we've been fortunate that you know great leadership here in the area. Uh, they had a BRAC committee that you know set us up for success. And each time there's been a a, a BRAC and a realigning of you know where where organizations go. Uh, we've fared really well and now the Space Force is coming here also so I mean we are set up for success here in North Alabama uh, but you know the, the rest of the state is as important and that's going to be my task going forward is, is to get out there and, and meet with folks from you know Mobile to Montgomery to Birmingham to Tuscaloosa and everywhere in between uh, to, to understand what their issues are and make sure that I represent the entire state. And have you been getting out there and meeting the people? Get so the, the ground out, the war, war the ground war just started. We <laughs> we we started with an air war because uh, I've only been in the campaign a week and a half. So uh, the initial focus was on the air campaign, and uh, and now we're starting the ground campaign. But I yeah I I will be uh, pretty much booked for the next seven months uh, going around and, and meeting with people and, and getting a. I think I know. I mean Alabama is a red state. I think I know people are generally conservative. I understand generally what the issues are, but there are regional issues that I want to make sure I, I, I know as well as I, I can so that I can represent appropriately. Is there any issues you'd like to discuss and talk about with our readers and, you know, tell them what you're passionate about? Well, you know, let's, let's circle back on Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still in shock, honestly. You know, when, when uh, like in, in my role in business or in, in the execution of a military operation, if, if you set a plan in motion and then something happens, you shift to a contingency, right? Or you reassess or you, you know, you tap the brakes and you figure out, all right, so this didn't go exactly the way we thought it was going to go. 
you know, let's adjust fire. I mean, that's, that's just human nature for us who've done tactical planning or run a business. So you look at Afghanistan, and, and Joe Biden sets this timeline for us to withdraw, and you start to see province by province the Taliban taking over. And instead of tapping the brakes and saying, well, okay, there's not quite the stability we thought there was going to be here. Perhaps we need to relook this. He does the opposite, doubles down, and basically tries to get the Afghan leadership to stay quiet on the fact that the Taliban is basically taking over so that it doesn't hurt him politically. You know, it just it goes beyond my ability to comprehend the fact that he cannot appreciate we, we were in Afghanistan for almost 20 years, more than 4,000 lives lost, many of those contractors, many of those active duty personnel, and he is throwing it away. Well, he threw it away, along with all the assets, but quite frankly, compared to the lives and the sacrifice, the assets are meaningless. And he threw it all away for, for what I call a soundbite. I mean, he wanted to be able to say, I got us out of Afghanistan before the 20th anniversary of 9-11. For that, he gave it all away not even the counting on, the, the, including the fact that we had a strategic presence in a very sophisticated airfield in a country that borders Pakistan, China, and Iran. I mean, how much more strategic can you get than that? You know, and, and we hadn't lost a, an active duty person in a year. All we had to do was stop calling it a war. Just you know, continue to train the Afghans. Actually, my company was involved in training some of the Afghan maintainers. You know, you can't teach someone who worked on Russian aircraft, if they even worked on Russian aircraft, how to maintain a Blackhawk in, in, you know, in six months. I mean, it, it takes a long time. You have to groom them, you have to do the introductory level tasks, then the more advanced tasks. You know, once we committed to helping them stand up this capability, we have to commit. I mean, our allies were committed. They were sort of left standing there. Where did the U.S. go? You know, along with U.S. citizens, Afghans who helped support the cause. I mean, it was just an absolute travesty. So, you know, that that is one of the issues. We need to make sure we we find who is accountable here. We had general officers who testified recently that they told him this was going to happen, and he ignored it. I mean, we have to hold somebody accountable. We, there is too much that was sacrificed and earned that was thrown away for just, just, just to be kind of buried in history. We cannot allow foreign policy, policy decisions like that to, to go un, unchecked. The vaccine mandates is the next one. You know, I got the vaccine. I didn't want to get it. I really didn't. I had COVID. It, it was not a big deal for me. I know it is for some, but it wasn't for me. Uh, so I should have some level of immunity. I mean, there's a debate about, you know, whether or not there is or there isn't. But I felt like the risk of getting COVID again was not greater than what I view as uncertainty about the long-term effects of the vaccine. Now, everyone's opinion is different on this. You know, some of that are super pro-vaccine are going to tell you, oh, it's been tested. We know everything. We don't know everything. We do not know if that vaccine is going to have any effect on human bodies 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, we just don't know. It got pushed out pretty quick. It seems to be effective. So I got it. Now I got it because I didn't want to be responsible for, you know, disrupting any of our contracts or, you know, spreading the virus here to any of our employees, spreading it to my family. But that's a personal decision. To see the government require vaccinations to keep your job is ridiculous. I mean, and, and I just don't feel like enough of our elected officials are pushing back on this hard enough. And again, why? Because they've never run a business. They don't understand how important it is to keep your employees. I mean, think about the issues we have right now with, uh, with uh, labor. And now you're forcing me to terminate someone who wants to work, who's qualified to work, who's experienced, and may not want to get the vaccine for religious or health reasons, and I got to fire them. I mean, it, it is it's just, again, an example of people making decisions that have not lived in the real world. I mean, I had three people come up to me last night. We did a fundraiser here. One guy, they turned his badge off. He can't go to work. Another guy's an engineer. He's going to be looking for work in two weeks. I said, come work for us. I mean, 
you fill out an exemption where you you attest to the fact that this is against your religious beliefs, and we'll take you. Uh, it, it's just amazing to me. As defense contractors, we cannot even let people work from home. I mean, it's completely illogical. We can't take a testing option. We can't let them work from home. We can't even work in the same. If you share an elevator with someone who works on a defense contract and you're not vaccinated, you're subject to a $700,000 fine per incident. I mean, it goes on and on. I'm in total agreement with you there. I, I, I have great, uh, what's, the, what's the correct word? I have apprehensions about the long-term effects on this, but I, like you, I got the vaccine. I, my whole family did. If you're asking me, do I believe in it? I'm kind of on the fence on that one. But at the same time, I don't believe that they should mandate everyone get that. I mean, with with no testing option and no work from home option. That's ridiculous. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, you got people that would say, look, if I don't have to get the vaccine, I'll test every day if you want me to. And, and what would be wrong with that? But they're, they're not letting us even do that. It's just ludicrous. Yeah, I don't understand it. Yeah, so, you know, this all feeds into what's mo- motivating Mike to want to get in and do something. You know, <laughs> I just, I, I say this honestly, I, I, it's why I started Pinnacle. I didn't want to be, you know, 75 and looking back on my life and, and seeing, you know, this this junction in my life where, I could have done something and I did. And, and, you know, maybe everything would be fine without me, but I don't know, you know, and, and can I make a difference? The only way I'm ever going to know is to get in the fight. And, uh, you know, my goal is to move the needle. I can't save the world, but I can move the needle. And, uh, you know, with a few other folks doing the same thing, we can, we can turn this thing around. And so is there any other issues you'd like to discuss while we got the time? Well, I mean, I'm conservative, so, you know, it's all the, what I would call the, the standard, cons, you know, Republican conservative positions on, on the Second Amendment, First Amendment, Second Amendment. I am pro-life. Uh, you know, I, I know that that is a, a real flashpoint with a lot of people. Uh, if you are pro-life, I think you look at the other side and you, you can't reconcile the fact that this is an unborn child. I mean, if, if, you know, six months later you did to this child what you're saying you're going to do now, you'd be tried for murder. So, you know, there's a, there's a scientific argument, there's a medical argument, there's a, a, an ethical argument, a religious argument. I mean, it's a complex issue. But as a, as a father who raised six kids, to think that, you know, Somewhere along the way, we, we would have made a decision for whatever reason to, uh, to abort any of these kids. I can't even, can't even get my head around that. So I think if, if people really thought about it in those terms, they, they'd probably second guess this, you know, a woman's right to choose. I respect women. I mean, I, this is not anything against women and, and their role in the workplace and society and everything else. but. You know, biologically, they, they are the ones who carry the children. And it is, in the end, you know, for them to decide. But I, all I can say is I, I wish that they, more of them would look at this, you know, step back and forget about their rights and think about that unborn child's rights. So, so that's one. Um, uh, you know, the illegal immigration, that's another hot button issue for sure. And I think where things get mixed up here is that people forget about the word illegal. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they think they focus on immigration. Someone did it today. I did an interview earlier on the radio and and they brought up the topic of immigration. No one's against immigration. I mean, <laughs> please come to this country and 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 be a citizen, but please do it legally. You know, we, we have a process. We're asking you to follow it. If you come in here illegally, we don't want that because we don't know who you are, we haven't vetted you, and you're not in the system. So many don't pay taxes, yet they're still a burden on society. And, and there's, there's nothing un-American about 
asking people who want to be American citizens to do so legally. And, you know, we are blessed in that we have the oceans that protect us on, you know, left and right, where we're vulnerable, obviously, is in the northern border and the southern border. And most of the focus is on the southern border. Uh, the only way that we can truly seal that off is with a wall. And, and I think people get wrapped around the axle about the wall like, you know, it's, it's anti-immigration. It's not anti-immigration. It's controlling the flow of immigrants it, through a, a weak point in our perimeter. I mean, if you think about it from a tactical perspective, and, and it's the right thing to do. And I think that needs to get put back on track. We got to support our Border Patrol agencies. You know, the fact that you got a Border Patrol agent on a horse that looks angry shouldn't become this political flashpoint. You know, that guy's trying to do his job. And, and, you know, those jobs are hard. People don't realize when you're in law enforcement, you're in the military, you're border patrol, you get faced with some tough situations and, and you know, your training kicks in and your everything kicks in and sometimes mistakes are made. And, you know, none of us are going to tell you that everybody executes to, to, to perfection. But, boy, the liberals and Democrats and left-wing people just jump on that like, you know, we're, we are, uh, you know, inhuman and... Uh, you know, that people are going to pay for, for that kind of behavior when, in fact, I don't know. I, I don't know what the scene was all about. It looked like a guy on a horse to me. You know, but they're trying to find any excuse they can to undermine everything that makes this country great. And uh, we got to stop it. And the good news is you just saw a governor's race in Virginia that proves, even in a blue state, the majority of people in this country are still somewhat conservative. They do not want critical race theory taught. They do not want things taught to their children that they don't approve of. They want to have some say in it. I mean, you know, this is most of America. And, you know, if, if it happens in a place like that, you can guarantee it happens in a place like Alabama, where it's much more red and much more conservative. Well, excellent. Uh, Mike, I, I don't want to take up your whole afternoon, but uh, we really appreciate your time. And... Uh, you know, and we wish you all the best going forward with your campaign. Is there anything you'd like to finish up? Uh, maybe a message to the voters out there and uh, the people that are listening in? Well, I know you get a lot of vets that listen in. And, uh, you know, I'm a vet, but I, I, I do want to express my appreciation for the service of all veterans. Uh, you know, I got a unique story, but the sacrifice is universal. We, we all made it, and uh, thank you for that because, again, it's a big part of what's great about this country, people willing to sacrifice to, to do what's right for the country. And then, you know, from an election perspective, I, I need support. I need, you know, people have their own social networks, get the word out. We need people to vote in the primary in, in Alabama. The primary is probably going to decide who occupies this seat, and that's where the real race is. So. You know, a lot of people skip the primary. Please don't do that. Come out and, uh, and cast a vote for me. And if you want more information on, on what I represent in the campaign itself, uh, the website is MikeDurant.com. That's M-I-K-E-D-U-R-A-N-T.com. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk today and uh, wish you all very well. Well, thanks, Mike. And uh, again, maybe for somebody who's read your story, I feel like I already knew you a little bit. And it was a pleasure to get to talk to you and meet you in person. And, uh, uh, you know, if we're ever up in the Huntsville area, we'll check you out. All right, please do. Yes. Come on down to Alabama. We get more votes. Yes. <laughs> well, I live down in the state of Florida now. And, uh, you know, it was funny you, you, when you talk about immigration real quick. Uh, I, I spoke with someone a couple of months ago who was uh, somebody who was going through the legal process of becoming a, a citizen and he was very upset because it's taken him several years to do it the right way and he you know was quite upset about the way some people are just getting a, a free ticket inside and, and 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 rightfully so you know i mean there's a sweet spot where it's you know this is the right due diligence to go through to make sure that you know this is a a, a person we want living here in our country, sharing and, and all the greatness that this country has to offer. Uh, but it shouldn't take years. I, I agree with that. All right. Well, 
We want to thank you for joining us today. We want to thank all our listeners for checking us out. We'll be back with another podcast here real soon. But from myself, Steve Balistrieri, all of us here at Soft Rep Radio, thank you to our guest, Mike Durant. We wish you all the best going forward. And we'll be back with another show uh, in the very near future.